So um, Ericsson would naturally wait until there was a moment where people were going into them inside themselves. And his sessions, his hypnosis sessions, would last about two hours, about 90 minutes to 120 minutes. Because uh, uncannily, intuitively, he sensed that within this period of time, people would naturally go into a kind of a quietened phase within themselves. And he would wait for this to occur and then he would uh, proceed. So we're going to be learning how to recognize this. And the, and the one thing is that the sun is beating a heartbeat out into the universe and the strongest phase of that heartbeat is priming the left hemisphere and the weaker phase of that heartbeat is priming the right hemisphere. Okay. okay. My name is Ken. Um, a couple of things I've been noticing that I'm learning lately. One is very strongly uh, the power of my speech and asking for what I want. And another thing I'm learning about is intimacy. So uh, on the North American continent here, uh, what is this? Uh, what is the symbol of intimacy? The mouse. The mouse. Because uh, the mouse is a symbol of being up close small and up close. So the mouse is, uh, the field mouse is a symbol of, of intimacy. And you know something, if, that, if you could get a mouse to crawl over you, I think that would be very auspicious. <laughs> <laughs> that would really mean your energy was excellent. Right here, this little one. Yes. You saw the mouse Really? <laughs> My goodness, Carlita, really? <laughs> Well, I think that, you know, there's something special going on when you have the ability to be able to be close to a mouse. I think that's amazing. That's really good energy. It was a baby mouse, was it? And, where, and what about, where's the baby mouse now? Back in home? In the compost? <laughs> And is the, is the baby mouse eating the compost, or...? There we go, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, okay, I think that... Uh... So if this was a representation of this moment, we're, I'm just going to go over a couple of meta-programs for everybody, and then we're going to go outside and we're going to play a few games. And the main thing I want to share with you is right throughout the, the rest of this course, you know, uh, we're only going to have you sitting for about 20 minutes, that's about it. And uh, activity is going to be occurring on a, on a regularly, and I know that our attention span is only about 20 minutes, so I'm going to stick to that 20-minute uh, kind of time frame. Um, I just want to share a couple of meta-programs, which is, which is ways of sorting information. Okay. Now, meta programming, neuro linguistic programming, is a li language lingo meaning for a way of sorting information. So that's what a meta program is. So some people have a meta program for sorting for likeness, for what you understand, Ra rather than sorting for difference, what you don't understand, what doesn't fit. So it's a good idea for us. To to get into this mode of being able to sort for likeness. We love it. Uh, yeah, people are attracted to others who are sorting for likeness, sorting for what they understand rather than sorting for what you don't understand. If I was to ask you what you don't understand, yes, I think some people would laugh a little, right? Because what is that? If you don't understand something, what is that? It's truly what, what it is that we do understand, actually. So listen with understanding to each other and uh, some of us I guess left things to the last moment to do uh, when we were at school and uh, then learning becomes became state specific to anxiety and then and then memory retrieval also became state specific to anxiety 
And so there was a need for anxiety to be able to regurgitate the stuff. And so we uh, created that feeling of anxiety somehow. And, and of course, epinephrine, which is a substance, was released and, it, and vasoconstricted my heart and then turned the blood pressure up a little bit and turned my reticular activating system up inside my brain. So then I really was alert. <laughs> and so some people, right, learn this way. And, and, uh, and so you'll notice that this person when you're with them, this is very funny, you'll chuckle inside when you hear this going on, right? Some people will be sorting for a difference and they'll be polarizing with you. Now that, that need of being able to polarize, because without polarizing there would be, there might be less ability in the person to be able to, to uh, recall because the polarization is creating anxiety. So the person says no, you say something and then they say no, and then they say something which is adding something to what you said, but they said no to what you said, right? That's common. Another thing that's a common one is people who say but. Okay? You, you, they'll say something and then they'll say but. Now but, as it were, always negates what came before it. I like you, but. <laughs> now you'll be very wary now when you hear this word but. Because, uh, because we're, going to be, we're going to be talking about what creates integration in our language and in our behaviour. And but creates a disjointedness. And so this person who, who is in need of having this anxiety to be able to have ability to recall because, that's, because, they're, they're, because it's just become, anxiety has become state specific to memory retrieval, you know, uh, you're in need of saying, you know, like if you're introducing scent to them and you know they polarise, you might say to them, well, I know you probably wouldn't want this, but I'm wondering, would you, you know, would you like to try some? The more likely the person will say yes, okay? <laughs> because you've said you probably wouldn't like some of that. So, um, uh, you would, you, uh, it's important that you develop an ability yourself for a language which creates whole brain functioning and that you have the ability to pace somebody else's experience. So sometimes somebody is using negative words and sometimes there's a need for you to, to be able to pace them before you can lead them somewhere. To develop rapport with the person, you're in need of sometimes pacing that polarization. Okay, so now if this was a representation of this moment in life, some of you are thinking about yesterday this much. And some of us in this moment are thinking about tomorrow this much. And so today might be taken up with something that might not at all be about today. So this idea of living in the moment. I uh, ran a motor development clinic at New York University for some years and uh, the first thing that I was teaching people that were coming back to the university to upgrade their, their uh, education, um, you know, I had, a, I had various populations of people that w I ran a clinic. And uh, so one population was uh, uh, what, what I call teaching disabled, not, not uh, learning disabled, but teaching disabled. It's, if we're going to put a disability on somebody, may as well put it on... Uh, somebody else, not the person so much, right? So, um, and because these people can learn, they do learn, and then it's the way of how do you go about finding out how this person is learning? And so we're going to be finding out how each of us learn new information. So the first thing that I would teach these people is to bring uh, our clients into an integrated, bring them into the moment. So they might wear a hat, you know, or uh, they might costume up a little bit. The main thing was uh, doing something, in fact, to bring these people into the present moment. Because these people generally were dissociated. This was part of the, the teaching disability, in fact, the, of, of, the, of the child, that they were dissociated in life. So we're going to be learning what it means to be dissociated, what it means to be associated. And you're going to be learning the difference between the words what is congruent and, and being inter integrated.
because all of these words mean something specific. So anyway, uh, okay. Um, one more thing, a couple more meta programs. Uh, it's a good idea to elicit that playfulness uh, in self, uh, because this is this we are the most flexible when we're in a playful state. As Penny knows, she could say something to someone in a humorous way, and they would take it. Uh, Penny's in charge of some 50 odd or maybe even more people she has underneath her and uh, so what a wonderful thing it is to if you can see something that is going a little bit awry and if you were to say something in a serious way well then everybody would feel like you know you'd got down on them in some way and uh, an ability to create a little humor there it's, pe it's people are much more accepting uh, when there's humor there so De to develop kid rapport, a little kid rapport. Um, if you look at me now, just um, this is uh, what I'm doing with myself here, and I'll tell you what it is that I'm doing. Uh, this is developing kid rapport, and you can sell anything to anybody, Dave. What did you say? Kid rapport. kid rapport. You can sell anything to anybody if you develop kid rapport. Uh, because we're most flexible when we're uh, when we're accessing this, and and actually now I was really exaggerating it, right? Because it's subtle. When this works, it's very subtle, okay? Because the main thing is now you can imagine. Look, my chin is down here, taking in this angle. My eyes are up there, taking in this angle. So I'm going through life like this, okay? As opposed to this person, like who's the opposite, doing something else, right? They've got their chin out like that and the ankles running up like that and they've got their eyes of course if you've got your chin up like that you have to have your eyes you know be able to see straight down like that and so this is the angle that's occurring do you, do you notice this yes and you know when i've got my chin in like this you know i'm taking in this angle i'm taking this angle and we're the most flexible and uh as opposed to passing judgment you know, putting the chin out a little bit and, and looking down the nose okay so uh uh, when, it, when these are working, it's, this is very subtle usually, and I'll, I'll do some things to really exaggerate them so that you can you can notice it. So well, when we're in a playful state, we're the most flexible. Um, and so if there's a way when we we come together and you we have the opportunity to use our voice, that you are able to focus on what it is that we are learning, what it is that you are learning, what I'm learning. So that you are using your voices when we add things to the group here and it's a focus on learning. And that you are sensing what it is that we have in our hearts that we want to hear. And that what can you be a spokesperson for that we want to hear, it, that we have in our hearts. All right, let's take a five minute break and uh, we'll be outside we're gonna play. We're gonna Self in their excellence so you'll be gifting them something as well something that you've made something that you found somewhere something that you've had at home for a long time something that is symbolic so um, I might share I might give something to somebody that's made out of, of uh, turkey feathers and uh, then I would say that the turkey uh, is a symbol of family because the turkey very much is a family bird. And uh, that the turkey is uh, monogamous. And, uh, and that the turkey, when I give it to you, this feather is a symbol of abundance. Because uh, the turkey, you know, in the native way, was always a symbol of abundance. Of course, at Thanksgiving, and uh, the turkey nearly was our, uh, our national uh, symbol. So uh, giving the turkey feather enabled me to say all of those words. And each of the words that I shared with you has a physiology. So then whenever the person looked at the feather, they would be reminded of something that was, that there was meaning for them. It would be a reminder of family. So uh, we are interested in, in developing a family here. And so throughout the next 14 days, we are really going to be developing a family. And uh, we're going to be doing things together that we couldn't do individually. 
and uh, I think that it gives us the opportunity to be interacting as we would in a family and having that aspect come out in, in this, situa in this uh, setting. So uh, we're going to be, we're truly uh, going to be caring and tending for each other and making sure that everybody is safe in the things that we're doing. Um, and uh, anyway, so supporting the person. Okay. <clears throat> I would uh, like to share the, uh, this little story with you uh, because I think that it's majorly shaped my life. And uh, I was very young, about five years old, and I was sitting on my grandfather's knee and uh, I was asking him why it was that our family some seven generations ago left Cornwall in England and uh, travelled to uh, Tasmania and settled in some islands in between Tasmania and the mainland of Australia. So I'm, I'm Tasmanian. And, uh, and I remember my grandfather sharing this story with me. And uh, he said that, or oh, he said uh, his grandfather told him that the people in Cornwall had erected this huge machine in the village. And all of a sudden my grandfather said that it seemed that the people were being governed by this machine, that they had to be somewhere when it got to a certain place. And then they had to be hanging around or waiting before they could head off somewhere again when this machine got to a certain place. And I and I used to think, well, this is strange. This animal was, this machine was like governing the people. And it was uh, some time later that I learned about what this was. This machine was a clock. And my grandfather was sharing with me, surmising with me, the importance of natural time, the importance of cyclical time, the importance of personal time. And this was the reason why they left Cornwell. The, the value of these three ways of feeling and experiencing life. And generally, when somebody is stressed, it's always that one way of being able to uh, move through that stress, stress is generally one way to do it is a time frame. We're going to be eliciting each other's timelines we're going to learn to do this uh, probably uh, in the next few days. Uh, and this is how you organize time. But anyway, when stress occurs, generally it's because, like, here's something that I want to do that's here, and here's something else that I need to do, and they overlap. And where they overlap, this is what uh, creates stress. And so the minute that I'm able to create a different frame of reference for time, Maybe I look beyond this time frame and then it takes me out of this, this mode here. So, um, so uh, I'm, we're going to go over an ethic for uh, uh, behaviour change. Uh, and uh, the first thing, the first ethic that we're teaching the pra our practitioners is this. And that's that we have an ethic that, that, that means that you're going to elicit a re resourceful physiology and that if you're interested in, in uh, the process of change, then the way to go about doing this is to elicit resourceful physiology in the person to be able to collapse any stuck state into that resource state. If you build a resource state which is large enough, you can collapse any stuck state into that resource state. Now, that's a principle of whole brain functioning, and that's a principle of, of the change work that we do here. So you're making sure that the person is in a resourceful physiology when you affect the change, and that you are sure that the resourceful physiology, the resource that you've built, is occupying a large enough population of cells in this person's head that if you brought some stuck state to this physiology, the resource state would collapse the stuck state into it. So this is an ethic in the way that we would go about behaviour change. As much 
as there's a way for you to, to move uh, through the process in this way, uh, we are encouraging this. The reason why is because the person has the use of all of their brain when you are accessing resourceful physiology. And when some program is desensitized, basically this is, this is part of the structure of this program being desensitized. When we really look at what occurred, what you'll notice is that some resource was built. So that you know some moment in the past when somebody's been feeling down about something, and then something makes this person laugh about this thing, and they laugh and laugh about this thing, and they're rolling around on the floor with tears in their eyes, they're laughing so hard about this thing, right? Just in that moment that this happens, that's it. This memory has changed forever. And the brain naturally moves toward what's more congenial, what's more comfortable. So the very first thing that we are doing here in each segment that we do, and each day, and in, within the whole training, there's a, a, there's a set of guidelines occurring underneath. The first guideline is that we wrap this whole experience in a, in a visiting frame. So that when you are with each other, when you're with your clients, those of you who are, who are taking this course because you're interested in the dynamics of change, that you are always, as much as there can be, in a visiting frame. So I have a, f uh, a friend uh, in New York who's a, a, a physician, and quite regularly before he really got to know me, he would have clients coming in, and they absolutely would not be in a visiting frame with him, and he would not be in a visiting frame with them. What kind of frame? A visiting frame. Yeah, so for instance, we never go into somebody's house unless we're invited. And then whenever we, whenever we say hello to somebody, you know, we're greeting them, we're going through a visiting frame. And so what I'm saying is the very, to wrap this whole experience, of putting a frame around the experience, the first frame that is within this experience always is a visiting frame. And this is, this is kind of a frame, reframing, reframing some context, turning uh, shit into roses. This is the art, the art of reframing. Is being able to wrap a context around something which provides meaning. So, um, a bandler uh, gives us a story of a client uh, that he had, um, and uh, this uh, uh, this father brings his daughter to see him, and uh, the father is just raving, you know, really just just mad as hell about his daughter, calling her a little whore and saying all of these things, you know. And, um, and so uh, the first thing that the, the therapist does in this situation is uh, mark out this stuff that's going on. And uh, often somebody else will have a congruent response if they're saying the stuff, right? But then if somebody else says it, you know, they have an incongruent response. So the first thing that happened was uh, this therapist says, what do you mean your daughter's a little whore? Like that. And, uh, and so then the father says, she's been sleeping around or something or other, he says, you know. And she's too young to love. And so then the therapist says, do you love your daughter? This is the very first frame. Do you love your daughter? So he is getting the father to be speaking about his daughter first with love, coming from love and not this other trash that's going on. And uh, he, the father says, of course I love my daughter. And then the therapist says, does your daughter love you? And the father goes, of course my daughter loves me. Mm -hmm. So he just said that his daughter was too young to love and the therapist has taken him to the place where he's realizing that, well, his daughter couldn't be too young to love because she is loving him. So uh, this is a frame. And so the first frame, and always a frame that's existing within, uh, as much as you can do, have that frame there, is a visiting frame. So whether it's you're, you're uh, picking up a rock or you're going out and looking at a tree, there is a visiting frame kind of going on. And I can get an idea just by giving a rock and the way that you look at the rock, how you learn. Because this is, an, this is a replication of uh, something that's occurring as, at a deep structure inside you. And the way that you look at the rock is a metaphor of that. 
So the first frame is a visiting frame. Johnny, do you want to draw that frame? Okay, so now the second frame in, right, inside the visiting frame is a resource frame. You want to elicit resource. And so what we do is we've played some games and we're going to be playing games on a regular basis, all different kinds of games and things. And the reason why is because we want to elicit resourceful physiology. And uh, I can share with you that uh, this is the way to have access to all of the brain. So, so that's useless, really useless. If you are unable to access resourceful physiology, the person's only going to be relying on past, learned, right, short sequence things. That's it. And you want the people that are with you to be able to be using all of their brain. And so that's very important that you have the ability to access resourceful physiology in the people around you and that we bring out the best in each other. Okay, so uh, there's a symbiotic relationship here, not that one is separate from the other, but that there's a, a, a string of things happening here, and that always that we're kind of within a visiting frame. The minute, minute that I was involved in the change process and I realised the person was not interested in visiting with me anymore, <gasps> that would be the first thing that I would need to be taken care of. Because, it, because the, you know, otherwise I'm acting on the person, and the person's not becoming party to the process. So, uh, so the very next uh, frame is, uh, is an outcome frame. What is it that you want? And so you're focused on what it is that you actually want. And, you, and so that, that's the very next frame that comes, in, comes within this. So once you are understanding what it is that you want, the next frame in is a frame that's involving trust. Um, now, uh, in the manual, it would be a good idea for you to go over this. And uh, there's a, in the old manual, in the technician's training manual, um, there's a, uh, uh, you'll see how they, this runs together. It uh, starts on page 94, and it's actually it's a re the information. The is, manual. Yes, the yellow manual. The, it starts on page. And this will be something that you will everybody take note, read this tonight, because tomorrow morning when you come in, we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the meta programs that are within this this uh, writing. Uh, X Tool is a fictitious um, uh, company, a telecommunications company who asked me to review a training uh, video that they have made. Said 94. Uh, page 94, and it finishes on page uh, 107. So on page 106, I think uh, there's uh, some of, uh, on page 105, you'll see uh, these frames, these eight frames, basically, that we're going through now. So I'm, pointing that out so that you will read this tonight and, and again it will it'll reinforce what it is that we're saying here today. Okay? And there's a way of going through those frames. And so I, I just uh, wrote this so that the people who were then doing promotional literature in the video would use these frames to keep, to keep people interested and to ensure that the directives that were inside the video were inlaid. Uh, into, uh, into into uh, programming. So trust. So so we're going to be doing some things straight after this that's involving trust. So that we each trust each other in this process, uh, and that we're building this uh, this element of trust. So we're going to be doing some activities that that build this trust. Isn't that interesting? That you could be working for someone, or. Uh, or you could be with someone who absolutely does not trust other human beings. They have not got it wired into their body, the trust of other human beings. And so uh, this is a one aspect of our training that we're involved in, is wiring in trust uh, so that we are, all, we are trusting of each other. So the very next thing after trust is ability to, to be involved in the process itself, which is uh, ability to co-create 
nobody really likes to cooperate. We really don't like to cooperate too much. To be operated on, to cooperate, to operate, to be, go under the knife. We don't generally like to cooperate, like, you know, standing there and holding a candle and passing it on or something like that. If you feel that you are uh, co-creating, you know, we love to be involved in the creation of something. And, uh, and so uh, co our ability to co-create together is uh, wrapped on the outside of challenge. Okay, so challenge is the next frame. That, that you, are, you are interested in eliciting challenge because otherwise it's boring. Right? So that you are truly in sensing. Now, what is it that people are interested in? What do they have in their hearts that I can be a spokesperson for? What do they want to hear that they have in their hearts? And what can you be a spokesperson for? So uh, that challenge is there. The main thing is, what would happen if challenge was a frame wrapped on the outside of our ability to co-create together? Can you think of a situation like this, where challenge is on the wrapped on the outside as a prioritization in the way we're going about things. Challenge is wrapped on the outside or competition is wrapped on the outside and on the inside of that is our ability to co-create together, to cooperate. What happens when competition is on the outside of our ability to co cooperate together? Yes, you, you, I mean, you could use this example in thinking about how we, we behave as a group on some of these elements. What happens when, when uh, something uh, is... What happens when competition, like challenge, right, is wrapped on the outside of our ability to co-create and cooperate with each other? Yes, exactly, Alec. Excellent. Why? Are you f understanding this? What did you say? It's possible that harm can occur. That's true. Harm occurs when people are much more interested in being co-op, in, in uh, competitive with each other before they're interested in being cooperating with each other. Like a football game, it's possible for people to get hurt. So the main thing is here that the, the framework that's happening here, right, there is, there is a legitimate uh, reason why these frames are occurring this way so that you are making sure that, first of all, we are cooperating, we are co-creating with each other, and then inside that, there's challenge. So that, you know, this is great safety for people. Do you, do you catch that? Do you follow that? Yes? Follow that, D. Makes sense, um, yes? create challenge before um, cooperating? Create, create cooperating before challenge? Yes. Can, can do, you, do, do you sense it, Tanya? Yeah? I bet you've been in a situation before where people who have been much more interested in, in uh, competing with each other than uh, they are cooperating with each other. And you know something? These people generally, you know, their social friends, their social playing friends start to become as rare as hen's teeth because uh, you can imagine someone on the tennis court, right, playing tennis and they're calling every line call the person who's calling every line call, eventually they're not going to have anybody to play tennis with, even if it's true, their line calls, because there's a degree of socialness. So sometimes it might be out, you know, and I might say, well, I might allow the other person to say it's in. Well, that's okay. I think of the value of the friendship rather than my, com you know, competing against this person. Okay. So uh, it's, very, it's important that you are eliciting some degree of challenge here and that I, that I am challenging you and that you are challenging yourself so that you are moving beyond self and bringing in those things. Okay, so the very next thing then would be an integration frame. How is it that we can use this information? and the meaning of, of this idea of something being within itself and that there's a structure inside in the way that you go about things and that we are building the inside. Because anybody who can transform the internal can transform the outside. And so this whole course is about developing a structure on the inside to guide the things that you are doing in life. That the 
example, setting up a criteria in life to, to, to live by? Yes. For example, that if you can live by the truth, and once you have to live by the truth, that once you don't, you can do nothing else to tell. It's the end of it. Yes, because Alec, I would say in the silence uh, is the truth, mostly. The truth is often spoken in the silence. And that if truth is making your free behavior the path, then I would say that's excellent because anything that's uncontrived, I would say is pristine like the sky. So the child who burns holes in a upholstery with a cigarette lighter, you know, you know, in your Ferrari or whatever, you know, you, we have to support that child. And that moment that the rug was pulled out from underneath the child's feet, this is the first time that a child learns to lie because there's something very unfair going on where love may be being withdrawn because of some behavior. And this, this is very unfair to the child. And so the, this is when the child first learns to lie, to protect themselves. And what a wonderful thing it is for us to be listening with our hearts to this child and having insight because let's say mother brings a child to their first day of school and they're walking around the schoolroom and uh, the child goes who paints that ugly picture kind of points this picture on the wall and the mother goes oh that's not an ugly picture she's you know sharing with the child and uh, of course the teacher has heard the meaning of this and the teacher says to the child, it's all right to paint ugly pictures. You can paint pretty pictures too. The, the teacher was understanding why it was that the child had said that. Whereas the mother was just going along with, well, that's not an ugly picture. Or the child's walking along and goes, who broke that? Kind of pointing to a toy on the floor that's broken. And the, and the mother goes, oh, that's, you know, you don't need to know who broke that or something or other. And then the teacher's understanding why the child said this. And the teacher says, it's all right. It's all right that sometimes toys get broken. Because the child was wanting to know, well, what boy, was that, was that, was that boy or was that girl punished for breaking these toys? And is that all right that toys are broken? You see? So, learning to be able to see, learning to be able to listen with our heart to the intent of something that's being said. And so, uh, the, so that you, it would be important in the learning process and the behavioral change process that there's an integration frame occur. So that at the end of the session with the client, there is a, a place where actually there's some integration is occurring. And that once this integration is occurring, now the next frame, which is the eighth frame, which is very important. Those of you who are interested in learning the process of hypnosis and the use of language to affect change, that's very important that you learn how to future pace. Because this, what you do will be strengthened intensely if you have the ability to take people into the future, to their jobs, to their home where they'll be sitting, thinking back to this moment, having the learning of this moment then, thinking about the meaning of this, so that you are providing a context with which the person will be experiencing and, and that the, what you've elicited is an anchor for the learning. So that when the person is sitting in their car driving home from here, you know, you have elicited a moment in their mind where they've seen themselves driving, you know, in the car where they felt themselves driving in the car. And now when they feel themselves driving in the car or sitting in the lounge chair at home, there's a possibility that there'll be a f f reflection back to this moment, thinking of the meaning of this. And uh, so it would be important, for instance, that um, it doing a, ch a, ch a piece of change work, that once the change work is done, that I'm able to think about 
context of when it's likely that something may occur and so I'm going to do a piece of change work with Penny sometime here and uh, we're going to future pace something to occur in the future so that when Penny arrives in this situation she has a program that will, uh, that will be fitted in rather than arriving somewhere and, and uh, the possibility then of, uh, of uh, the program uh, not, not coming out actually in that moment when it should so that you're taking the person to a context where they can have the learning actually and that they can use this learning. Okay, I think after we play some games, maybe we'll have someone, uh, if you're in someone is interested to volunteer, we'll do a little uh, hypnosis and maybe there's something you would love to feel better about. Maybe there's a, a, some memory that you would enjoy being desensitized. Maybe there's uh, something that's coming up in the future that you would enjoy feeling more resourceful about or something. It could be a myriad of things. It may be something that you're interested in having a new behaviour for or something. But anyway, um, when we come back inside, we'll uh, do a little bit of a... Hip we'll do a 10-minute hypnosis demonstration and, and I'll share some things with you, which everyone here is going to be learning. Are you saying that you can hypnotise somebody and desensitise them of the uh, experience of the negative Okay, so I'm going to put it in a language which is giving the person the uh, power because I'm like a pebble on the beach and you really are the ocean and I'm a pebble that you're really curious about and you really are the ocean so here's what I would say uh, uh, the person is is going to experience a hypnotic state and I'm going to be helping facilitate that so that's giving the person the thing rather than saying that I'm going to be acting on the person Okay, so, Bruce? Uh, you mentioned maybe 120 cycles and then switching over right. and then switching back. Do you have to take that into account when you're ready to introduce a future pace? Oh, excellent, okay. Well, uh, the main thing is if you are really wanting to <coughs> install the program so the person doesn't even have to think about it, just going to happen, then the way to do this is when the brain is quietened down. So uh, in the process of hypnosis, uh, there's great advantage to making use of the time when this person's mind is sluggish. When everybody's mind is sluggish, this is the hour of a shaman. When everybody else's mind is sluggish, about midday, when everybody's really sluggish, this is when you can really slip some things in. <laughs> and when everybody's tired at the end of the day and people's minds are very sluggish, this is a, this is a powerful time. And I make use of this time. When people's minds are sluggish, you'll notice I am really active. Is that, is that, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> so there's less defences. But what does that have to do with the cycles? I mean, even okay, so okay, so excellent. Okay, so when a person is getting going into more of their right hemisphere, you'll naturally notice kind of the jaws uh, dropping a little bit. You'll notice a person starting to get in, go into a quiet and phase a little bit within themselves. Um, you may notice that even their body position changes just a little bit so that they're kind of letting go a little bit more on the left side indicating that this brain is now starting to uh, relax and that this person is coming into their heyday where their right hemisphere is being primed and it would be important that you have access to their right brain because all of this matters most when you, you are speaking to the person's unconscious mind and that you are speaking to the unconscious processes in the person as well. Because if you're only speaking to the conscious processes, the unconscious mind can be, going, can be talking about something else. It can be doing anything. So it's harnessing the right hemisphere, actually. Uh, each of us are going to be quite understanding of this process, that you could speak to a physician someone who had studied exercise behaviour physiology, you would easily have the ability to hold your own with someone like this. 
So there will be some understanding of brain processes. And we're going to be talking a little bit about the physiology of excellence today. Okay. Um... Alright, so let, familiarize yourself with these frames because this, these frames are being used all the time. And that for, the, for your, the change work that you're doing with others, that you go through these frames. You usually go through a certain order, that same order? Yes. So for instance, today we'll finish with a future pace. Mm -hmm. And that you'll notice in presenting this exercise, I finished with a future pace. Yes, so for instance, uh, actually, uh, Christiane, you are doing this, actually, you are doing this when you are working with your clients, right? Mm -hmm. You say, hello, how are you today, and how things are being, visiting frame. Mm -hmm. And then you are looking to see the resourcefulness between the two of you, and you are, you are saying, oh, how was it at that party, or whatever it was, and, and you are eliciting resourceful physiology by the things you were talking about, right? Because, I mean, on the table, you wouldn't be interested, like you're working on somebody saying, talking about, you know, uh, the dolphins being killed or something like that.